Top temperature reaching 11 Celsius with light winds. A few light showers are still possible across northern Scotland this afternoon, but most places will remain dry. Glasgow will see some sunshine and top temperatures of around 10 Celsius. Mostly cloudy skies for Northern Ireland this afternoon with outbreaks of rain largely in the west, turning breezy too. Maximum temperatures reaching 10 Celsius, which is 50 Fahrenheit. Much of the UK will have a fine end to the day with just some patchy rain across the northwest. And that is how the weather is shaping up for the rest of the day. Join me and Naya Filar and Iman for the discussion every Sunday at 3 p.m. here from big ideas to question shaping the public conversation. We tackle the moral, cultural and political implications of news stories. We need to share this conversation democratically. It has become so toxic, this debate. They relish this kind of discourse. From fascinating guests to challenging ideas, you won't want to miss it. The discussion every Sunday at 3 p.m. here at GB News. Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering. As their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighbouring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70 150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. Darren Grimes, cheers very much for your company on telly, DAB and online. Today we'll be getting to the bottom of whether or not we need public service broadcasting in Great Britain. We'll celebrate Prime Minister Boris Johnson's visit to Ukraine and we'll look ahead to a busy day of sport. But first, it's the news with Miranda. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's two o'clock. I'm Miranda Shunka in the GB newsroom. President Zelensky has asked for more military aid and financial support as Ukraine braces for a new Russian offensive. It comes as the Ministry of Defence says Russia is reviewing personnel discharged from military service since 2012 to bolster troop numbers in response to mounting losses. Russia failed to take any major cities since it launched its invasion, but Ukrainian officials say forces are being gathered in the east for a renewed major assault. Former military intelligence officer Philip Ingram told GB News the West needs to make sure Ukraine is ready for the next major Russian offensive. There will be a big attack coming in from the southeast to try and um, capture properly the disputed Donbass region. 
um, uh, and the Russians are resetting that. They're resetting their command and control. They're moving their armored formations around, and this will probably be a very large armored formation uh, move with lots of support from air and rockets and missiles and, and everything else. If the Ukrainians can blunt that, stop that, and start to push it back, then Putin is properly defeated. Nine humanitarian corridors have been agreed to help residents escape heavy fighting in the east of the country. That's according to the Ukrainian Deputy Prime Minister. Officials have urged people to leave by any means possible, including private cars from Mariupol, while the governor of Luhansk says a fleet of nine trains will be available for evacuation. An inquiry has been launched to find out who was behind leaking details of the Chancellor's wife's tax status to the media. Rishi Sunak's multimillionaire wife, Akshata Murthy, announced on Friday that she would pay UK taxes on her worldwide income after the disclosure of her non-domiciled status. Mr Sunak has seen his approval ratings drop three points to 28% in a new poll by opinion, as Labour accused him of hypocrisy, claiming his family had potentially saved millions of pounds while he was raising taxes. The Mayor of London has thanked the outgoing Metropolitan Police Commissioner on her final day in the job. In a statement, Sadiq Khan commended Dame Cressida Dick for her work in helping to bring down violent crime in London. The Commissioner decided to step down after the Mayor criticised her handling of a series of scandals which have plagued the Met during her time in post. Former Scotland Yard Detective Inspector Hamish Brown told GB News the next commissioner must be tough on misconduct. misconduct. It's taken a terrible bashing, the reputation of the police service, particularly that of the Metropolitan Police. So that's where the there's got to be a charm offensive, I think, in certain ways to show that changes have been made. The message they're going to put out about misconduct that's going to be perhaps more for priority. One commissioner's lost their job and the next commissioner won't want to go the same way. So maybe stricter disciplinary measures. Merseyside police have launched an investigation following an incident in which Manchester United forward Cristiano Ronaldo appeared to knock a mobile phone out of a supporter's hand at Everton. Footage appears to show the player smashing a phone out of a rival fan's hand and onto the ground as he limped off the pitch following United's 1-0 defeat at Goodison Park. Ronaldo has since apologised on social media. The club confirmed they were aware of the matter. Haulage companies are calling for priority status at port crossings into Europe. That's if they're holding perishable goods. Bad weather, Easter traffic, IT issues and the suspension of P&O ferries at Dover has led to long queues. The British Meat Processors Association say some of its members have had to wait for over 24 hours to cross, causing meat and other perishables to go off. The Department of Transport has yet to comment on the call for priority status. And incumbent French President Emmanuel Macron and top challenger far-right candidate Marine Le Pen have cast their vote in the first round of the presidential elections. Voter turnout at midday was at 25% below the rate of the 2017 elections. Polls on Friday showed Macron with a slight lead over Le Pen. Experts predict a very high abstention rate with one out of three people not voting. Well, this is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now back to Real Britain with Darren Grimes. Welcome to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Cheers very much for your company. Here's what's coming up on the show today. With the government deciding to go ahead with plans to privatise Channel 4 just this week, a channel founded by Margaret Thatcher's government in 1982 to deliver programmes for underserved audiences, I'm asking the question, do we need public service broadcasting anymore? Many of us would have put down a bet on the Grand National yesterday, but from October, advertising rules will change and footballers, celebrities and social media influencers will be banned from gambling adverts. We'll discuss if we need more measures in place to protect the vulnerable from gambling in the midst of a cost of living 
crisis. Also on our Scrap Reform Keep segment, the plan for new petrol and diesel cars to not be sold in the UK from 2030 is still going ahead. We'll be putting that policy to the test. That's what we're talking about for the next hour. I'd absolutely love to know your thoughts on public service broadcasting. Is it still needed? You can tweet me at GB News or email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. You can also watch online on YouTube and don't forget Facebook. Lots of brilliant content and interaction on our GB News page. Cheers very much. Yesterday, the Prime Minister was abroad on a foreign trip. The British Prime Minister conducts many trips that often seek to boost British trade, interests and morale overseas. They're usually pretty plastic affairs, with understandably strict security and precious little actual interaction with real people of the host nation. Often, the leaders are there for this obligatory photo op that was barely worth the cost to the taxpayer of transporting the leader and their security detail. However, folks, I think yesterday was different. The one that took place yesterday was quite something. It was a moment, I think, to feel immense pride in British foreign policy. And it was undoubtedly the most extraordinary of Boris Johnson's career. The Prime Minister was yesterday holding surprise talks with President Volodymyr Zelensky in the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv, and it reminded me why this man and his mop of blonde is a unique politician. Boris has his mojo back. He isn't just another yes man, and he's able to be courageous when it matters. Travelling to Kyiv, undoubtedly heavily opposed by British security and intelligence, that takes real guts and an evident drive to ensure Britain is seen to be taken a stand. Research by the pollster YouGov shows that public opinion is favourable of Boris Johnson's performance since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I dare say these scenes will only bolster that growing respect and admiration from his domestic audience at home. There were scenes of nameless civilians seeking to offer the Prime Minister their thanks and thanks to the whole of the British people for our foreign policy efforts. You'd have to have a heart of stone to not be moved by the scenes and the outpouring of love for Britain yesterday. For many years now, folks, you are well aware of this, I've no doubt. We've been told that Britain is small and insignificant. We've been told that Brexit would be the end of us as a global power. In our stellar support of the Ukrainian fight for freedom, we've seen, in my view, that this was defeatist nonsense. Thanks to the British people's vote to leave the EU, we've actually been able to announce the removal of tariffs on all imports from Ukraine and the reduction of regulatory barriers between our two nations. These measures mean the might of the British economy will be there to support Ukraine in its recovery. Ukraine can rely upon the British lion's support. This to me, I wonder folks, I wonder if all of those who said we were absolutely nothing without France and Germany holding our hand, we were nothing without the Brussels conglomerate, that we were so diminished as a nation, that we barely even existed without the EU club of 27. I wonder, folks, I just wonder if perhaps those in Britain, even those Britain sceptic commentators out there, if they look at the scenes of our PM yesterday, for our radio listeners, we've got the scenes running on the screen there of the Prime Minister shaking someone's hand, the actions of our nation, and the fruits of our taxpayers' support make me, and I don't know about you, but they certainly make me feel immense pride. Especially, especially folks, when compared to those EU nations that remain dependent upon the teat of Russian gas, with no signs of that abating anytime soon. Power and economic support for bad Vlad's war machine. We may well be small, but we sure do know a thing or two 
about standing up to belligerent bullies. It's a moment, folks, I reckon, to admire both Britain and Boris for our leading role. Now, folks, the government has announced that it wants to privatise Channel 4. Culture Secretary Nadine Dorries has said that government ownership is actually holding the broadcaster back. Public service broadcasters are required by law to provide content which are considered beneficial to the public good. But in 2022, do we need public service broadcasting? It's what I want to find out. Here to discuss, I'm joined by Dorothy Byrne, former head of Channel 4 News and Current Affairs, and Duncan Simpson, who's the research director at the Taxpayers Alliance. Hello to both of you. Thank you very much for your company. Dorothy, can I start with you, please? Can you just make the case for me for public service broadcasting in 2022? Well, you were just talking there, Darren, about us taking a leading role, being a great nation and your immense pride in our country. And one of the things we can be proudest of is that we have probably the best public service broadcasting in the world, and I would argue definitely in Europe. And if you think of those poor people in Russia who are not hearing the truth, they would love to have the system that we have, where you have several absolutely excellent public service broadcasters giving you duly impartial facts about what's happening in Britain and the world, and giving it to you from slightly different perspectives, slightly different agendas, because we've got Channel 4 owned by the public, BBC funded by the public, and then also we have ITV and Channel 5 and Sky, absolutely excellent broadcasters too. We are really fortunate in this country to have great news, current affairs and documentary, as well as wonderful comedy about our own country, not just comedy imported from America, and wonderful dramas about our own country and our own problems, like the great dramas that Channel 4 has made, the great comedy, Derry Girls, and the great drama of uh, It's a Sin. I mean, altogether, absolutely fantastic. Makes billions of pounds every year by selling the copyright uh, and the programmes around the world. So great for our democracy and great for our economy. Thank you, Dorothy. You missed our GB News there, mind, but I'll let you off this once. Duncan, is British Broadcasting... <laughs> you are a new, wonderful addition. <laughs> well, there we are. Thank you very much. Duncan, is British Broadcasting under threat? As Dorothy says there, we've got a rich tapestry going back many years to be proud of. Are we actually putting that under threat by seeking to privatise or do down our public service broadcasters? Uh, no, I, I, I don't think it's under threat. Um, Channel 4, obviously, numerous stations available to, to viewers here in the UK. I think the ownership structure of Channel 4 is is pretty outdated. Obviously, it was created in the 1980s, as you were saying earlier, with a very specific remit in mind. The public service obligations which they have to fulfil are, are pretty vast. I think it's a mission that um, Channel 4 did to... A Lord's Committee about five years ago showed they had to do over 200 hours of uh, news output and sort of separate current, current affairs as well. Um, there's no particular reason why this kind of programming or brand new programming couldn't couldn't happen as and when it changes from public ownership um, to, to when it's a privatised model, if indeed that does, that does go ahead um, in the future. And I, I mean, there's also one particular example, Channel 5, for example, and that was taken over by Viacom, I think it was, in 2014. Um, now, when it went through the process and sort of a new buy was found, obviously there were very large concerns that if there's being bought out by a big American company, then um, a lot of the you know good quality programming will be dumbed down, and um, you know some of the points which have just been made by the previous guests, that kind of quality of programming would change. What actually happened is that Channel Five actually exceeded what was the previous public service broadcasting requirement. So I think that's sort of one concern that could be allayed. But I think ultimately. It's, it's a really peculiar system. You have this in the BBC, for example, every sort of, five, I think, 10 years it is with the uh, with the charter renewal, whereby ministers and senior BBC executives have to negotiate what kind of programming, not, not you know, hour by hour what the BBC has to be producing, but in sort of broad strategic terms, 
what they had to be making. I think that's a really odd, odd system that in you know 2022 in the UK that politicians aren't you know directly determining what the BBC is producing, but they do nevertheless have you know quite a big, quite a big say as to what's being done. So I think you know basically this should be left to um, TV producers and presenters, and you know the idea of this basically heavy politicisation just isn't appropriate anymore, be it in the BBC or Channel Four. Dorothy, what Duncan's saying there is basically, if and Duncan, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but basically, look. Private industry, private broadcasters, they have to be in tune with what the public actually want to see on their television screens. Otherwise, they'll fail. Without the, the teat of the taxpayer, you have to actually ensure that you're catering to the vibrant taste of the British public, don't you? Well, first of all, ITV and Channel 5, most people are not aware are also regulated and are also required to carry some public service televisioning, uh, television programming. But I think the key thing you have to look at is the amount you would be likely to get. If you look at what Channel 4 does, it's got an hour of really um, expensive news, about a third of it international. It's creating terrific programs that you don't get anywhere else, like Unreported World. I mean, it literally does what it says on the tin. Those are stories that you're not seeing elsewhere. It's doing fantastic investigative television, like the program that it did just um, last Monday about what was happening with children working to create Cadbury chocolate. So you would get something Yes, but you would get less. And, you know, you talk about it being peculiar. Yes, it is peculiar the way that we ha uh, have worked out how we have broadcasting in this country. But you know what? It works. And when something works, don't get rid of it. Channel 4 doesn't cost the public a penny, not a penny, and it has contributed to making billions of pounds for this country. Why get rid of that? Dorothy, before I let Duncan respond to that, would you accept that here at GB News, for example, we're free to give everyone a platform to voice their opinions, and actually it's holding public service broadcasters back by not allowing them to have the same flexibilities and freedoms? I think you want two things, don't you? You want places where people can see opinions, such as the opinion that you just voiced, or in the Daily Mail, or in the Guardian. But we know. Oh, I don't from think I'd be found there any time soon, Dorothy. Sorry. I don't think I'd be found on the pages of the Guardian any time soon. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we know from massive research that Ofcom has done over years that the British people really value also duly impartial television news that is the requirement for the main channels. Some people might disagree every now and then, was that really duly impartial or not? Well, there's a regulator they can complain to. Sometimes the regulator upholds those complaints. But as we saw in COVID, the British people really value being able to turn on, I have to admit it, mainly the BBC in a time of crisis and knowing that they're going to hear the duly impartial truth. So, Duncan, would you accept then, I know the Taxpayers Alliance have an Axe the TV tax campaign calling for an end and abolition of the TV licence. Do you accept that we would lose impartial broadcasting? No, I don't. Not in the current situation. Obviously, as Dorothy has enumerated, Ofcom, um, beyond public service broadcasting requirements, you know, it's not just the amount of programming which has to be produced. There are restraints for all broadcasters in the UK at the moment, GB News included, in terms of what they basically can and can't say. I mean, not for, not for word for word, obviously, Darren. Um, so, you know, the current situation is that the, the way that uh, broadcast and the broadcast and their news are seen in you know kind of esteemed impartial terms it's very unlikely to change or where to get rid of this where to get rid of this entirely another thing i say on channel four as well you know it is indeed the case that the taxpayer is not directly funding uh, channel four it is you know 
owned by uh, owned by the government, owned by us, but doesn't receive um, monies on a on a day by day basis. I mean, ultimately, that's I think actually quite instructive. But Channel Four is basically a very commercially successful operation. I mean, the revenue from advertising last year, I think it was approaching seven hundred million pounds. So this is a huge source of their revenue, basically the main main source of their revenue. So there's no particular reason why that wouldn't function in the future, both in terms of the output that Channel Four is doing at the moment, um, as well as uh, I think it's very unlikely that um, advertisers would you know turn their noses up at a at a company which has suddenly gone private. So. Um, yeah, yeah, probably quite an obligation for quite a few of these companies, but there's no particular reason why this impartial nature couldn't change. And, you know, of course, it should be moving to um, private hands at some stage. OK, thank you, Duncan. Dorothy, just really quickly there, I just want to ask you, in 2019, you were quoted as calling Boris Johnson a known liar. Do you think you're responsible as the former head of the broadcaster or the news output for Boris Johnson's desire to privatise Channel 4? I think that that is nothing to do with it. I think that what the proposed privatisation of Channel 4 is all about is throwing a bit of red meat to his right-wing supporters. Uh, it won't make a billion pounds. I think most estimates are it will make half a billion pounds as a one-off payment and the nations and regions of this country will lose out. Well, we shall see. Thank you both very much for your company. That was Dorothy Byrne, former head of Channel 4 News and Current Affairs, and Duncan Simpson from the Taxpayers Alliance. Cheers to both of them. Next, folks, we'll be diving into the world of sport. Plenty has already happened this weekend, jam-packed, and there's plenty more still to come. A huge game in the Premier League kicks off later today. A possible title decider between Man City and Liverpool. But first, let's have a look at the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking dry for many with increasing amounts of cloud. Let's take a look at the details. Skies will cloud over this evening across the southwest, and the breeze will start to pick up. It won't be as cold as yesterday evening, though. There will be some clear spells across the southeast this evening, and it will stay dry. There will be a keen breeze, keeping temperatures around freezing tonight. The cloud will be thicker across Wales, perhaps giving the odd spot of drizzle over the hills, but it will stay dry for most. The blanket of cloud will also extend across the Midlands, but it should stay dry. The cloud will help prevent a frost. Skies will turn cloudy across northern England tonight, perhaps with a few spots of rain this evening. It will turn breezier as the night goes on. There could be a few outbreaks of rain in Scotland tonight, particularly in the west. It will also be a mild night here as temperatures stay above freezing. Rain will continue in Northern Ireland this evening with a few heavy downpours in places. So most places will stay dry through the night, but there will be some heavy showers in the north at times, but it should stay frost free for all. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Join me, Anaya Falar and Iman for the discussion every Sunday at 3 p.m. here from big ideas to questions shaping the public conversation. We tackle the moral, cultural and political implications of news stories. We need to share this conversation democratically. It has become so toxic, this debate. They relish this kind of discourse. From fascinating guests to challenging ideas, you won't want to miss it. The discussion every Sunday at 3 p.m. here, GB News. Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering. As their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighbouring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. 
If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. Welcome back. Now, folks, if you've had a relaxing weekend on the sofa, there's been plenty of sport to keep you entertained. Golf, the Grand National, Formula One, and there's a huge game in the Premier League later. Ben Jacobs is the sports journalist at CBSC, and he joins me now. Let's start with Man U, might as well, losing 1-0 to Everton. They're not exactly helping Newcastle out, I'm afraid to say. But what's actually going on at United? They seem to be a club in total free fall and far cry from the halcyon days of the 90s. Yeah, good afternoon. First of all, I think Newcastle will be OK because, of course, they kicked off the weekend with a really important 1-0 win over Wolves. So fear not about that. But we are seeing some oh, big results at the bottom of the table. And Frank Lampard needed that victory, didn't he, for Everton? But Manchester United all over the place. And first and foremost, they need to get a new manager in place. And even though that's not going to happen until next season, the stability of knowing exactly who that will be is going to be really important to the football club. Eric Ten Hag is the most likely appointment, but he only over the weekend said he doesn't want to engage in rumours. Usually that is affirmation that he's very much in the mix and the front runner because he didn't deny the story. But Ten Hag is remaining coy and Ralph Ranić admits that Manchester United may not deserve Champions League football the way that they're playing. They've still not been able to sort out their defensive frailties and they were just lacklustre at Goodison Park. They barely mustered a shot on goal and Cristiano Ronaldo had a big incident as well walking off the field that he's been forced to apologise for where it very much looked like in frustration he lashed out with his right hand and smashed an Everton fan's phone so it was a terrible afternoon for Manchester United and Arsenal lost as well so the big winners of the weekend were Tottenham who got a highly impressive win away at Aston Villa and they're now up to fourth. Yeah, I mean, we just saw um, the footage there, for photographs for our radio listeners of Gordon. That goal from Gordon was absolutely amazing. But 4.30 today, Man City versus Liverpool. How big is this game? And actually, I'm going to ask you to play the role of Mystic Meg for a second and give me a prediction. I think Manchester City win um, by three goals to one, but a lot is going to determine the Premier League race and the style of the game is going to be key to that as well because you've got the best attack against the best defence and if we see a defensive minded game and it's cagey and uglier it will play into Liverpool's hands and they've got plenty of firepower of their own but if Manchester City are free flowing they'll win the game at home and what makes it interesting is because there's only one point separating the sides Manchester City have got that advantage and if Manchester City win they not only go four points clear but they've got much easier fixtures to end the season than Liverpool. Conversely, if Liverpool win, they'll go two points clear at the top, but they've still got a Merseyside derby. They've got to play Manchester United. Hey, they've got to go away at St. James's Park against Newcastle, mm. which suddenly is a really difficult place to go and get all three points as an away side. So I think if Liverpool win, the title race is kind of 50-50, even though they'll have a two-point advantage. But if Manchester City win and comfortably, they may not only find themselves with a better goal difference suddenly than Liverpool, but that four-point advantage with the likes of Brighton and Watford to play and a few other easy fixtures as well. I think that will be too much for Liverpool to claw back. Interesting. Ben, at the Grand National, of course, yesterday, I don't know if you had a little flutter yourself, but we're seeing more and more in the press 
that there is scrutiny and criticism of gambling in sport. Have you noticed this throughout your career? There's been, a, I think, a, well, pretty powerful campaign that would some might call a little bit paternalistic, actually, and say it's actually damaging the fun from having a little bit of a gamble. Do you think that's right? I think that sports normalised gambling in the same way that decades ago Formula One had a normalisation around the tobacco industry. And unfortunately, it is toxic to an audience that are having a second screen experience whilst they're watching sport, which means that you can easily have a gambling app on your phone whilst watching another screen and the game. And as a consequence, with all the new in-play markets, there's a challenge to control impulse and make people aware that there comes a point for some, if not many, where gambling is no longer fun and you have to stop. So those that have a little flutter as a one-off on the Grand National will say they've always done that and it's kind of part of their culture and they may be in control of that spending. But there's lots of people out there through the glorification of gambling and sport that end up spending beyond their means or throwing money perhaps at their team or putting on long shots and over time wasting money, throwing away money. And the key thing is there needs to be that education to make sure that first of all there's controls on so it when. and the gambling in say again sorry awareness of it isn't it ben thank you very much for your time as well ben that was ben jacob sport journalist there you're with gb news on telly online and dab radio before 3 p.m i'll have the motor and journalist quinton wilson he'll be taking part in scrap reform keep today we're looking at the ban of new petrol and diesel cars from 2030 now it's time for a check on the news headlines with miranda Thank you. Good afternoon. It's 2.33. Top stories from the GB newsroom. Ukraine's president has called for further sanctions against Russia by the West and for additional military aid as the country braces itself for an attack in the east. Military analysts say Russia is regrouping its forces with shells fired into the Luhansk and Dnipro regions today. Nine humanitarian corridors have been agreed to help residents escape heavy fighting, with officials urging people to leave Mariupol by any means possible. An inquiry has been launched to find out who was behind leaking details of the Chancellor's wife's tax status to the media. Rishi Sunak's multimillionaire wife, Akshata Murphy, announced on Friday that she would pay UK taxes on her worldwide income following disclosure of her non-domiciled status. Mr Sunak has seen his approval ratings drop three points to 28% in a new poll by Opinion. Haulage companies are calling for priority status at port crossings into Europe if they're holding perishable goods. The British Meat Processors Association say long queues have caused some of its members to wait for over 24 hours to cross, causing meat and other products with a shelf life to go off. The Department of Transport has yet to comment on the proposal. And Merseyside police have launched an investigation after Manchester United forward Cristiano Ronaldo appeared to knock a mobile phone out of a supporter's hand at Everton. Footage appears to show the player smashing the phone out of a rival fan's hand and onto the ground as he limped off the pitch following United's 1-0 defeat at Goodison Park. Ronaldo has since apologised on social media. The club confirmed they were aware of the matter. Well, on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Stay with us, Real Britain with Darren Grimes. We'll be back in just a moment. Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering. As their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. 
These charities include the British Red Cross, Care, Oxfam, Save the Children and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighbouring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70 150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. Welcome back to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Thank you very much for your company. Now, folks, the UK's gambling industry is a multi-billion pound venture, and many of you may be a few quids up after the Grand National yesterday. But sadly, reports suggest some have fallen for the addiction associated with gambling, which in turn affect the health relationship and, of course, their finances. In the Times this morning, an investigation into middle-class gambling addicts reads, get up, log in, play the financial markets and run the risk of losing big fast. Welcome to the world of day traders, so addicted that some need rehab. Also, the UK is now set to ban celebs from gambling adverts in October to try and protect children. I'm delighted to say I'm joined now by Christopher Snowden, who is the head of lifestyle economics at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Chris Howie, all of this sounds absolutely terrible, right? We're a nation that's completely addicted to this gambling nonsense, aren't we? You'd think so from reading the newspapers over the course of the last seven, eight years. I mean, there's been a very um, highly uh, orchestrated, uh, uh, orchestrated attempt to portray Britain as a country in which there's a spiralling problem, gambling epidemic, and children are gambling left, right, and centre, and just every, everything's advertised. Uh, everything's advertised in gambling firms, um, and it's just not true. This message I've been trying to rebut for some time without any success at all. But the statistics are really very clear. We started measuring problem gambling rates in 1999. They have not budged a bit. In the 20 odd years since, we have relatively low rates of problem gambling in this country. It averages out about 0.5% of the population. So the vast, vast majority of people who gamble do not become problem gamblers. And we shouldn't confuse problem gambling with gambling addiction, by the way. Gambling addicts, however you might define that, they're a subset of the problem gamblers. Um, the reality is most problem gamblers tend to be men aged between about 18 and 24 mostly and they mostly grow out of it um but yes you always have some level of people who get into trouble with with gambling um as i say mostly they they get out of it themselves but some people need cognitive behavioral therapy or so on um but what doesn't work is just bringing in all sorts of different rules and regulations around it uh, if anything it, it tends to drive it underground there is absolutely no correlation if you look worldwide between very strict gambling laws and low rates of problem gambling if anything actually you could say it's it's almost the reverse somewhere like china for example have very high rates of problem gambling about four percent and gambling is almost entirely banned there so, Chris, how would you actually go about uh, tackling the more severe elements then? Or do you actually think that football and other really quite high profile sports have quite a lot to answer for as far as this debate's concerned? No, I think that football has quite a lot to be thankful to, to gambling for. You know, I mean, there's a possibility that gambling sponsorship in sport could be banned because there's a new wave now of uh, anti-gambling agitation after the business with fixed odds betting terminals that you might remember. They've been essentially banned for three years. Nobody's talking about how that's improved anything, incidentally. Um, it's all been forgotten about. They've moved on to the next cause, which is mainly about advertising and, and sponsorship. And uh, it's well acknowledged by anybody who you know, kind of looks at the figures and knows the industry 
that, yeah, the Premiership would be all right. The Premiership will always be able to find sponsors. But you get below the Premiership, Championship, right down to the you know, pub, pub level, you know, local Sunday football team sponsored by the local brewery, for example. Um, they're looking at, and, and indeed sports uh, uh, I'm very fond of, like, like snooker, darts, rugby, all sorts of um, sports are, uh, are kept afloat, really by gambling sponsorship. And people might not like gambling. They might not want to gamble. They might not want to see so many teams sponsored by betting firms. But they put a huge amount of money into these sports. And without them, a lot of these clubs simply will disappear. Certainly in the case of snooker, there will be far fewer tournaments um, than there are at the moment. Um, so if the price of that is just to have somebody's shirt or a, a banner sponsored by a gambling firm, given that there is no evidence whatsoever that seeing gambling sponsorship turns people into problem gamblers or even makes people gamble to start with, it seems to me a pretty good deal. But unfortunately, governments uh, don't really have a lot of time for advertising. It feels like, the to them, it feels like the kind of thing, well, we can get rid of that and it looks like we're doing something about it. Actually, these things come with enormous costs. Yeah, I mean, Chris, I, what I would say is that I think there's a there's creeping element of paternalism. I mean, the Tory party under David Cameron used to say, you know, this Tory's not a nanny. Well, I think it is today because on everything from whether it be smoking, whether it be drinking, whether it be... And by the way, on smoking, the, the one thing that we seem absolutely destined to regulate is e-cigarettes, which are surely doing some pretty fantastic work as far as weaning people off the, the nightmare that is tobacco addiction. But do you see this sort of creeping paternalism? And does it make you think, well, God, why are we doing these sort of authoritarian measures to try and isolate a few problem scenarios? I, th I think it doesn't really matter what government is in charge. Um, and once a campaign gets going, it might be rebuffed for a while, like with the, the junk food stuff, the, the anti-obesity stuff, you know, the, the which is coming in later this year. We've just had the mandatory calorie labeling, but that really is the least of it. We've got this ban on buy one, get one free, ban on three for two deals. That's going to come in in October when inflation is set to peak. So this is really bad timing. But that's just one of a slew of obesity measures that were kicked down the road by Theresa May uh, from David Cameron and Boris rejected them. Boris decided to bring them in. My point oh, being, Chris, tell me about this. After, you've you've after written about years, this, Chris. This stuff will come in. You've written about this buy one, get one free offer promotion. I want to ask mm. you about that because I think that's really important because you're absolutely right. There are people out there right now that are genuinely having to make a choice between heating power in their homes, putting, you know, petrol in their cars and buying food in the shops. You're actually saying that the government are going full steam ahead with these, the bans. And there, Chris, you will know better than I do, but there are rules as well on what you can have near the pills in supermarkets as well. So high fat, high sugar, whatever it is, foods, you cannot have them anywhere near the front of the shop. And one, this is causing a hell of a lot of headache for small and medium sized enterprises. But equally, it's clobbering people at a time when actually promotions on meat and all these other things would be looked upon in really quite favourably. Yeah, it's particularly bad timing. But it's, when is a good time to unnecessarily put the price of food up for people? I would say there's never a good time for it. If you look at the Public Health England report from 2015 that first proposed this ban, uh, which of course is designed on getting people you know, eat, eating more healthily, um, Public Health England in the report itself said that in the period just after the financial crisis, a lot of poorer families used these deals as what they called a coping mechanism, a coping strategy. And of course they did. People use you know, bargains in order to deal with um, the cost of living. And the feeling was, I guess, by 2015 as well, inflation's quite low again, so we can get away with, with mm. doing this. Well, as it happens, it's going to come in when inflation's uh, at about 9%, uh, maybe, maybe more than that. So, you know, these guys know what's going on here. They know that this you know, puts serious pressure, particularly on low-income families. The reality is that the public health lobby and governments in general don't really care about the cost of living that much. They have other priorities, whether it's net zero or obesity or smoke-free by 2030. These are the things that politicians really care about. And they're quite happy to put up the price of things for other people and then shed some crocodile tears every now and again when inflation gets out of control. Well, the public health officials, or Chris, might turn around and say, well, hang on, because when we're talking about gambling in particular, we're actually seeking to make it so that people 
aren't exacerbating the cost of living crisis by getting themselves into massive amounts of debt. Yep, um, and if there was some way of waving a wand and stopping people becoming problem gamblers, then I think most people would support it. But there isn't. You need to have evidence-based policy here. And there is nothing, there is really no evidence at all. The House of Lords Select Committee looked at this uh, only a couple of years ago. They couldn't find any evidence whatsoever that there was any link between gambling sponsorship and gambling-related harm. Same with advertising. That they well, nevertheless supported the ban on sponsorship, although interesting, not on advertising, um, just because they felt, well, there's too many clubs being sponsored by betting firms. I mean, this is no way to run public policy, particularly when that public policy is going to hammer certain uh, sports teams and indeed entire sports by you know, uh, sacrificing a, a large sums of money. So no, a lot of this, it's an overused word, isn't it? Virtue signaling, you know, um, virtue, the point of virtue signaling is it comes at no cost. To you well it will come at cost to somebody down the line problem gambling is a psychological problem it needs to be dealt with by basically by psychologists the idea that you can use broad brush strategies bearing in mind that 99.5 percent of people show no signs of problem gambling um it's it just it just doesn't work you're doing something for the for the sake of it and i hope the government sees sense but i fear that this whipped up hysteria in the media over a period of many years from a pretty concentrated and well uh, coordinated group of people, including in the old party group on gambling related harm. Um, I, I fear that because of this and this myth that we're in a spiraling problem gambling epidemic will make uh, politicians feel they need to do something. Well, indeed, we will see Chris Norton, Head of Lifestyle Economics at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Thank you very much for your time. It's now 2.47 and it's time for my favourite, actually, folks, which is Scrap, reform, or keep. I've got my very high budget paddles with me now. And the UK, folks, is set to end the sale of new petrol and diesel cars by 2030. It's part of a plan to eradicate the UK's contribution to global CO2 emissions. But is it actually realistic? Can we do it by 20? 30. I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Quinton Wilson, motor and journalist and electric car expert. Quinton, how realistic? Come on. You've uh, no doubt been out and about in your electric car, travelled quite long journeys. How realistic is it, really, to expect us all to go electric by 2030? Or so after 2030? I've been driving electric cars for the last 10 years, starting with these little ones that only did 50 miles to one charge. And if you put the heater on, it would only do 30 miles to one charge. And they work. And here we are now with electric cars that'll do 250, 300 miles to one charge. So the technology has really accelerated over the last five, six years, and it works. It's viable. I've driven to France and back um, uh, 700 odd miles, and, and, and it works. So what we have to say is now we have this technology, it's time to wean ourselves off fossil fuels. And we've got this huge body of evidence, haven't we, from people like the Royal College of Surgeons who say that we've got 40,000 premature deaths due to respiratory problems because of the, the polluted air in our cities. And we know that diesel particularly causes lung disease, heart disease, and, and, and cancer. So as a civilized first world society, we've got to do something about that. Because if we've always done what we've always done, we'll always get what we'll always get, which is polluted air. And it has to change. So it is viable. And the prices of electric cars will come down. Experts say that probably by 20, 2024, 2025, we'll have parity with electric cars and combustion cars. So we can do it. And then we, we know about energy security with the Ukraine. We simply cannot carry on shackling ourselves to foreign oil cartels who don't care about the prices going down. All they care about is the prices going up. And yes. we could be looking at the three pound litre of diesel or petrol. So we have to do something about this. It's a real imperative. Quinton, I accept that. I accept that we need energy security. I've been arguing that we need this for some time on this channel. But Looking at the fact that, you know, the manufacturing of these electric cars primarily were dependent upon China. So aren't we just saying, look, let's wean ourselves off of whether it be Saudi or Russia for oil and gas. And let's instead make ourselves entirely beholden upon President Xi. 
right now, Darren, you're right, the Chinese have, have got a monopoly on the supply of things like cobalt and, uh, and lithium and graphite and stuff like that. But that's all changing. I mean, in, in America, Tesla have managed to get lithium out of, out of the desert in Nevada um, and, and doing it just through water purification. So all that supply chain of getting that stuff will change. We, for instance, are using far less cobalt in car batteries now than we ever used to. And some car batteries don't have any cobalt at all. So what we've got to do is rather than say, well, look, China's got it, so let's carry on buying oil, is we have to sort those supply chains out and where those, those precious metals, those critical minerals come from, and actually establish an industry here in the UK and in Europe where we are self-sufficient. So the Chinese argument doesn't hold because that's all changing. Yes. So as far as scrap reform keep is concerned, I'm assuming that you're very much in the keep camp. Yeah, because we need to think about the public health considerations of carrying on polluting like this. And don't forget, you won't be able to uh, buy a brand new uh, combustion car or, or van uh, after 2030 and hybrids after 2035. But you could continue running your, your, your combustion car for as long as you want. But we've got to tell the manufacturers that this is the line they're going to have to take so they can make business plans and they can invest and we can have cleaner air and energy security and better public health. It's, it, it's as simple as that. Okie dokie. Well, Quinton Wilson, you'll have to do a little bit more to convince me. I'm almost there, but a little bit more and I'll be right there with you. Motor and journalist and electric car expert, thank you very much for your time. Now, folks, it's time for Campus Clash. Medicinal cannabis has been legalised in the UK since 2018. You might not know that, but it's very rarely prescribed on the NHS. In a major new trial, thousands of people will be given cannabis as medication for pain relief. If it's successful, it could actually pave the way for the drug to be prescribed on the NHS for pain relief. Are you happy for the NHS to prescribe medicinal cannabis? Well, joining me to discuss, I've got the accountant student at Durham University, Jakob Koscheva, and Lauren Harrington, Harrington, even, Carter, sports and physical education student at Anglo Ruskin University. Jakob, can I start with you, please, to start this clash? Where do you stand on medicinal cannabis? Are you saying, look, we can wean people off paracetamol and other things, pain medications, this is the right route to test out? It's a drug we've known about for thousands of years. Even the pharaohs used it as a pain relief. But it's really difficult to get it on their um, NHS at the moment. So some people are having to go to the private sector to help with conditions such as arthritis, chronic pain, Parkinson's, and a wide range of other conditions which affect up to 2 million people across Britain. Now, some epilepsy treatment treatments can cost up to £2,000 a month. And I don't think it takes a genius to understand that this isn't accessible for everyone. Lauren, is it your view then that you just don't want this to happen? Not because I assume you don't want to, you know, have people experience pain in their lives. You wouldn't deny them the opportunity to actually relieve themselves of the burden of pain. But actually, are you concerned that this is just a gateway into other forms of addiction? I, I do. I, I think that I, I don't want to see people in pain. I don't think that is obviously nice for anyone. But I think we've got to look at the maybe criminal side of marijuana. Um, there is a lot of crime around it. I think if you're going to subscribe prescribe it to um, people via the NHS, I think it's going to make people want it more. Maybe, f maybe not fake, but you know, make conditions out to be worse than they are, so they can get hold of it. And then are we going to get into the thing of where people sell it off, uh, yeah. you know, and get addicted? other stuff and that sort of stuff. I, I don't think it's a good idea. Well said. Jakob, are you not concerned by there was reports of a 23-year-old law student who died from eating cannabis sweets at the start of the month? Doesn't that just show that we need to tread very carefully about how cannabis is viewed? If people think, oh, wait, well, it's prescribed by the NHS, happy Larry, I can have me fill. Aren't we actually putting people in harm's way? Um, well, firstly, addressing the law student that has sadly passed away, um, what she took was synthetic cannabis, something similar to spice, for example. 
which is completely different to what the NHS prescribes. Also, what the people take on the street, they usually um, look after, you know, look for skunk, which is um, very high in THC, which is usually responsible for, you know, the negative side effects. Of yeah, yeah, I get that, I get that, I get that. I totally get that. I see what you're saying, but I just don't think people will make a distinction between the two because of the NHS prescribing cannabis and they'll just see the word cannabis. But Jakob, you've got your view, I've got mine, Lauren's got hers. That was Jakob Kostacheva and Lauren Harrington Carter. Thank you very much for joining me on Real Britain. And thank you to you. That's all we've got time for on Real Britain. Thank you for your company. I'll be back Saturday and Sunday at 2 p.m. But for now, I'll leave you with the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking dry for many with increasing amounts of cloud. Let's take a look at the details. Skies will cloud over this evening across the southwest, and the breeze will start to pick up. It won't be as cold as yesterday evening, though. There will be some clear spells across the southeast this evening, and it will stay dry. There will be a keen breeze keeping temperatures.